So who's my guest this week? It is the Democratic Senator, foreign affairs expert, and former vice presidential candidate, Tim Kaine. I'm sending a clear message to the world. America is back. America is back. But as we've seen with the conflict in Ukraine, diplomacy is far more complicated than sound bites. President Biden's performance regarding Russia and Ukraine hasn't been graded yet, but for all the re-engagement, there have been missteps too. When that judgment is made, my guest will play a part. Sitting on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, he's a Washington pro who's been within spitting distance of the vice presidency twice. Now he's focused on, as he puts it, protecting the constitution from the enemies of democracy, foreign and domestic, and after suffering from long COVID, ensuring those still affected by the pandemic are not forgotten. With Russia accused of war crimes in Ukraine, how does he think America and the world should deal with Vladimir Putin? And on a more personal note, how do you get over nearly being vice president of America twice? When John Kerry became Secretary of State, he had a knock at the door that morning, and it's John McCain. He said, I gotta tell you, you and I are the only people in the Senate who have gone through what you've just gone through. We are the only two now that have been on a national ticket and lost, and I'll tell you, I've got the solution for you. And I said, I'm all ears. He said, just go right back to work. I said, you found me here. First thing, the first day we're open, you found me here, didn't you? There's been multiple reports of war crimes, now including the raping of Ukrainian women. Russian authorities have denied all. If the evidence is there, do you think we'll ever see Putin in The Hague on charges? When you target civilians, that's a war crime. And I believe he needs to get the, the Slobodan Milosevic treatment and the US needs to press for that. Thank you so much for joining me. Very good to have your company today, Senator Indeed, Kane. I, I wanted to start talking about how some have described it as confusing foreign policy under President Biden. In one sense, we get told at the beginning of his administration, America's back. And we see quite quickly, uh, in terms of diplomacy, a first major overseas act was to withdraw from Afghanistan. And now we see engagement with Ukraine. How would you define how it is at the moment? And I think the, um, the, the real key to the Biden administration, America's back, is America's back to link arms with allies. That's the hallmark of this administration that is the dramatic departure from the Trump administration. President Trump was a unilateral guy. He didn't like alliances. He didn't like treaties. He didn't like multi-party trade deals. It was all one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and that left many of America's traditional allies wondering, you know, is this just President Trump or is the United States, even the citizenry, uh, kind of retreating from linking arms with allies? Well, President Biden, with long track record of chairing the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, his work as vice president with leaders around the world, is back in a big way, uh, whether it's getting back in the Paris Climate Accord, restarting negotiations with Iran to see whether we can work in a multi-nation deal to stop a nuclear program there. But most recently, the work in Ukraine to assemble uh, NATO and non-NATO no nations in a very, very strong alliance to put multiple pressure points on Russia because of their illegal invasion of Ukraine. I see this as an administration that's really committed to America's role in the world, but particularly in linking arms with with allies and growing that number of allies. I suppose it's just, I'm very minded, one of my guests, the women's minister of Afghanistan. Yes. And she's now living out of a suitcase as a refugee in London, thinking, if America's back, how am I in this situation? And she described the most terrible escape from Afghanistan under the Taliban. And that doesn't feel like America is back. She, she's worried, she's concerned that America has forgotten Afghanistan. Well, we haven't forgotten. There are 76,000 Afghans who are living in the United States who weren't living here in August. And Virginia, actually, the state that I represent is one of the most common places. Folks came to Virginia initially. The resettlement processing was largely done in Virginia and the permanent residences of many of these are in Virginia. Now there's many more who wanna come and we're gonna work on them, but we have not forgotten that at all. But what President Biden concluded, and I agreed with this conclusion, is 
we had done as much with the military as we could do. And the next chapter in Afghan life had to be primarily directed by Afghans. And the continuing military presence of the U.S. after 20 years, should, should it be for 30 years? Should it be for 50 years? And so he made that painful decision. And part of the decision, I think the only way to understand it is also, we, we now view sort of the, the Russia and China as the great threats, the great adversaries. Um, for a long time, we defined our adversary primarily as non-state terrorism, but now we're seeing a different threat from China and Russia in particular. And that means we have to redeploy resources against the most significant challenges that we face. And that's another reason why 20 years of military investment in Afghanistan should come to an end. If that makes sense on paper, but the reality was very messy. It wasn't a good withdrawal. And now the country's on the brink of famine. And, and Yemen is, and Sudan is, and Ethiopia is, and Ukraine as a breadbasket of the world. That will create famine issues around the country. And we have an obligation uh, through our humanitarian budget and in other diplomatic ways to try to provide support for Afghans, and we're going to, uh, but, but the military uh, engagement needed to come to an end. Of course, now looking back and looking towards Ukraine and what's happened there, President Zelensky has given an interview to The Economist in which he talked about Western countries which either want a long war to exhaust Russia or those who are more concerned about humanitarian and economic side effects who want a short war. Which camp does America fit into? We, we want a short war. The Biden administration has decided that there, there should not be, at this moment, there should not be U.S. troops in or over Ukraine. But the scale of military support that we're providing Ukrainians is massive. $3 billion of U.S. military aid went to Ukraine from 2014 through the end of 21, a billion of that in 2021. Uh, we've just voted to send about $6.7 billion of military aid to Ukraine and an equal amount of humanitarian aid, and other nations are doing the same. But I will uh, credit President Zelensky that we're, we are not seeing the result as quickly as any of us would like. The economic pressure campaign canceling Nord Stream 2, UN resolutions, the intense sanctions banning Russian oil imports, these are all having a very significant effect on Russia, just as our military aid is helping uh, Ukrainians extract great cost from Russia, but we're not seeing a positive outcome as quickly as any of us would so like. So do you think America's done enough? I think, we, I think we can do more and we are doing more. I think this very bipartisan vote to do the $13.5 billion of military and humanitarian aid, combined with the work that President Biden and the team has done to encourage other countries to do a lot, it's pretty significant. As you know, Emma, when you see non-NATO nations like Sweden and Finland putting military aid into the Ukrainian Defense Force and considering joining NATO, which would have been anathema five years ago in those countries, when you look at Germany sending military aid to Ukraine, they've had a tradition of not putting military aid into conflict zones since the end of World War II. When you look at Switzerland being willing to play a really important role in the sanctions, nations are getting off the sidelines and realizing this is a fight between democracy and tyranny, and democracy has to win. There's been multiple reports of war crimes, now including the raping of Ukrainian women. Russian authorities have denied all. If the evidence is there, do you think we'll ever see Putin in The Hague on charges? We, ne we need to. Um, I started a call for this really at the end of the first week of the war, at the end of February, because it appeared to me that there was this indiscriminate targeting of uh, civilians, um, which is, you know, the war is illegal in and of itself, the invasion of sovereignty, but when you target civilians, that's a war crime. And I believe he needs to get the, the Slobodan Milosevic treatment, and the U.S. needs to press for that. Will we see him in The Hague? Um, we need to do everything we can to make sure that he is. How could you do that? You would have to find some agreement within the U.N., uh, to press forward on that, as was done in the case of the Balkans. Now Russia, as a Security Council member, has the ability within the Security Council to exercise a veto, but they don't have a veto on everything within the General Assembly. So we would need to look at the broader UN to see whether we could uh, promote a similar tribunal, as was the case in the Balkans. Now, none of this will shame Putin. I don't believe he can be shamed, but it might shame Russians to be a pariah nation led by a leader who's a war criminal. So you see him as utterly shameless? 
Uh, per personally, yes. But again, the not everyone in Russia, not all the leadership and certainly not the citizenry um, are without shame. The Russian people are strong people and good people. And I think if they had access to information, which they don't, um, I, I think they would be ashamed uh, that their nation is being led by somebody who is committing war crimes. How do you explain the invasion? How can you try and understand what it's all about? Because we're now looking at, as you say, a much longer fight than perhaps either side could ever have imagined. I mean, it's an interesting question. Let me, let me take you back a little bit. Um, the US and European allies were seeing the same data uh, and, and President Zelensky too, the uh, uh, amassing of troops on the border exercises uh, in Belarus, but we were interpreting the data differently. And during my time in the Senate, there hasn't been as wide a divergence. The US was interpreting the data as there's gonna be an invasion. Most of the European nations and President Zelensky, they were at least saying, we don't think that's going to happen. Now there might've been a little bit of uh, diplomacy in those words, but there was some sharp difference of opinion about whether this was just a, a border exercise to flex or whether there was gonna be an invasion. The US intelligence was right about this. How do I explain it? Um, I, I believe, although the countries are very different and the individuals are very different, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are similar in that they each have uh, an ideal for their country that I would call, they, they kind of view themselves as historical rejuvenators. They're trying to rejuvenate something that they felt was lost in the past. And that explains China aspirations with respect to Taiwan and it explains Putin's aspirations with respect to Ukraine, particularly because in his view, modern Russia started with the Christianization of Russia, which began in Ukraine. And so in his mind, there's sort of this mythology about what the greater Russia is, and Ukraine is very central to that. Can I ask you something about uh, your, your leader, President Biden, in March on a visit to Poland, an important visit, where he said nine words, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power, talking about Putin. As someone who is very familiar with how diplomacy works, how it should work, where were you when you heard what he had said and what was your reaction? Well, I, I wouldn't have said it. Um, I, I wouldn't have said it because the US, um, neither the United States nor the Biden administration considers regime change as an element of foreign policy. Now in the past, the US did that and often got it wrong. We failed so often when we uh, attempted to presume who another country's leaders should be. President Biden said pretty plainly, look, regime change isn't the U.S. policy, but I was just speaking out of my sense of moral outrage at the activities of Vladimir Putin. And I credit him for that. One of the things about Joe Biden that I really like is he's a man who speaks from the heart. And um, it's not going to always be poll tested or everything that has to be written by five speech writers. And so he was expressing an outrage that, frankly, the entire world feels. And those words did bring some comfort to Ukrainians and Russian opposition. But the US doesn't have a policy of regime yeah, but change. It was, it, was, it was clumsy from your ultimate diplomat, more than clumsy. In fact, I mean, I, I think it's important to hear what you think about the idea that this is the greatest gift for the Russian propaganda machine. Well, um, I, I, I don't, again, I wouldn't have said it, but I will say one of the Biden's strengths is he plays from the heart. Um, it, it, it's not all poll tested and it's not all eight speech writers control what he says. He plays from the heart and that- well, So did Donald Trump. That statement did express a very sincere revulsion uh, at what Putin is doing. No, but and I, the world if, should, if I put the world it, should I, be I recognize you wouldn't say it. Sorry to cut across you, Senator, but yeah. you know, if Donald Trump had said that, people on your side of, of politics would be jumping all over that, saying he doesn't know how to do diplomacy. These are the mm -hmm. sorts of gaffes that we shouldn't be hearing. This isn't the way that we do politics because his whole, President Biden's whole play was diplomacy is back. The grown-ups yeah, but, I, but I, dis, I, di, I disagree with you. I don't think there's any equivalence between the two. Um, and frankly, what we had with Donald Trump was cozying up to Vladimir Putin. I mean, at least Joe Biden sees Vladimir Putin for who he is. I mean, let's be honest here. The guy has invaded a country illegally and he's committing war crimes. Joe Biden sees that for what it is. Donald Trump admired that about Vladimir Putin. So there's no real equivalence between well, them. President Trump's not in this particular scenario at this time. Of course, much criticism has been leveled at him about exactly as you described. But I'm, I'm, I'm more trying to say, 
here you've got the president of the United States billing himself as the experienced diplomat. And there he goes and says something which really is a gift for Putin. All right, so put, put that on one side of the ledger and then on the other side of the ledger put, uh, persuaded the Germans to cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, assembled uh, an international sanctions regime that's been joined by dozens and dozens of countries, uh, reinvigorated NATO's commitment to defense of democracies, got non-NATO nations to also agree to send military aid into Ukraine. I, I, I agree, you can put the, those comments on the negative side of the ledger, but I think the positive side of the ledger is, is much longer with respect to what's going on right now in Ukraine. As you would see it, and those are important points, and of course, many people also talking about, you know, nobody wanted this war, nobody wanted this invasion, right. but there has been right. greater unity of NATO because yes. of it, and that strengthening of the alliance. I, I suppose it just also allows me to, to put to you some of the concerns some have had, not just in America, but around the world, mm -hmm. that perhaps... Joe Biden, this maybe adds to the perception that when he does ad lib and he gets it wrong from the perspective of not recommending regime change, that perhaps he isn't as fit or quite as up to the job as some have been concerned about. Polls in America have shown concerns about the fact he's nearly 80. And in November, for instance, his team put out a statement saying he had developed a stiffer, less fluid gait as a result of his advancing age. He's 80 years old, um, but uh, I can tell you from personal experience, I was with the president two Fridays ago when he invited me to the Oval Office with the family of a um, New York physician who died by suicide in the early days of COVID in April of 2020. And we got a bill passed in her honor uh, to try to make sure that our healthcare providers get mental health resources that they need. And I saw that in the Oval Office when he you know, pulled aside Lorna's mother and sister and brother-in-law aside and said, hey, I've lost two kids. I know how you feel. And, and I admire that you're taking the pain in your lives and you're trying to do something good for others out of it. And that's all we can do. In moments like that, you could hardly ask for a, be a better leader when you're connecting with people in tough circumstances. And there's a lot of tough things going on in our country and in the world right now. And there are. I think Joe Biden, is sort of a, a, a man for this moment. Again, and, and of course, you know, describing that, I'm sure it was a very emotional time to be with those people and connecting uh, through such emotional times and such difficult times. And I know that you, talking about COVID, have had your own experience of connecting yes. with people because I believe that you, you've been suffering from long COVID. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word suffering. I would use the word experiencing. I got COVID. Emma, right at the beginning in, in March of 2020, when we were here passing the CARES Act, the first big COVID relief bill, and we still didn't understand COVID that well. And I had very non-standard symptoms. But then as soon as I went home, I gave COVID to my wife. Just one more thing to feel guilty about. And her symptoms were really normal. So, oh, wow, this is what we have. We had mild cases, both of us, by mid-April 2020. Um, we were essentially, you know, back to work and doing everything we do. But I had this one weird thing as soon as I got COVID, just like this, um, every nerve ending in my body just started to kind of tingle or buzz 24-7, 365. I've, I describe it as like every nerve ending has had five cups of coffee. And it's not painful. And I can work and I can exercise and I can sleep. I, I, I recognize that you don't want to say you're suffering in light of those who, who are having far more serious symptoms. But that is still a striking thing that your body doesn't feel the same as it used yes. to. And, and yes. you know, it, it must be frustrating, I imagine, at times just to feel different in yourself. Yeah, it, it is. It's just uh, it's frustrating. I, I will say that I, uh, you know, a neurologist told me, I mean, for folks who might you know, be experiencing this, that a neurological after effect of a virus is not uncommon. It's not the most common thing, but it's also not uncommon and not just COVID. Other viruses can have a neurological after effect. And my neurologist said, you know, look, the good news is the neurological after effects usually don't get worse. The bad news is they may not get better. And it has just been sort of constant now for two years. It's not even a new normal because I, I just, I, if it was a new normal, I wouldn't notice it, but I, I notice it all the time. Um, but again, it, it just connects me with people who are dealing with it. And I, I started to talk about it in committee hearings because I wanted folks watching to know there was at least somebody on the dais who believed them. Many long COVID sufferers are not being believed. Yes, but just because you mentioned work there and also COVID and 
the time of reflection people have had. I was looking back at your career and thinking about what you have or haven't done or nearly done. And uh, you, you've nearly been vice president twice, I understand. <laughs> uh, nearly to President Obama, losing out to a certain Joe Biden. And then yeah. nearly, of course, with Hillary Clinton, uh, winning the popular vote, uh, but still just not getting there. How have you come to peace with that, Senator? I call myself an electoral college dropout. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you're in this line of work, um, there's wins and losses. Before I was in politics, um, I had a very high stakes legal practice uh, trying cases. I won the biggest civil rights jury verdict in the history of the United States. I also walked somebody into the death chamber in Virginia and held his hand while they strapped him down to execute him. You have wins and losses. Um, and you know, life just produces that. As soon as you think things are going well, watch out. And on your darkest day, a, a window will open. And that's, you know, I, I, I'm 64. I'm, I'm a lot wiser than I was when I was half my age, but I just feel like uh, a life fully lived is going to be ups and downs. And, you know, you're right. I was nearly vice president twice. And what that tells me is I'm not supposed to be vice president. So <laughs> I, I and I love and I love being a senator. I love being a senator. It, it was a, it was tough to, to be on a ticket in 2016 and lose. I was so thrilled. I, I helped President Obama become the first African-American president of the United States. I threw everything into helping Hillary Clinton become the first woman president of the United States to win the popular vote by a significant margin and yet fall short. Yeah, it was tough, but um, I just came back to work. The, the next day the Senate was open and just started working hard and that's what I've been doing really, since you just, you just went you just went back in the next the next time. I'll tell you an, inter I'll tell you an interesting story. We, we conceded on, in a speech Wednesday, the day after the election. The Senate was closed that week. The Senate reopened on Monday. Came back to work early Monday morning. First colleague who came to see me on that first Monday after the election in 2016 was John McCain. I'm in the office that John McCain used to have. He moved around the corner to take John Kerry's office when John Kerry became Secretary of State. Got a knock at the door that morning and it's John McCain. He said, I wanna come see you. I gotta tell you, you and I are the only people in the Senate who have gone through what you've just gone through. We are the only two now that have been on a national ticket and lost and I was running for president, so it's even more painful than what you're going through. And I'll tell you, I've got the solution for you. And I said, I'm all ears. He said, just go right back to work. I said, you found me here. First thing, the first day we're open, you found me here, didn't you? And then John used to say to me, he was my chairman in armed services, about every three or four months, he'd say, are you doing what I told you? Are you doing what I told you? And so he, he kind of, you know, was giving me a pep talk. Um, but that, that really is the, the answer, because every day, Every day, my staff and I, we have the opportunity to lighten somebody's burden, help a veteran's get a, get, you know, a veteran's benefit, help stop somebody from getting their home foreclosed. I got a great bill passed in the Foreign Relations Committee yesterday, sort of a historic one, if we can get it finally done, to say that no president of the United States can withdraw from NATO without congressional approval. So every day we've got a chance to do something good, and most days we do. And um, you know, that, that helps you get over the sting of a loss. I mean, I thought he was going to say, I've got the answer for you. Here's a beer and here's a whiskey chaser. <laughs> I mean, we, well, we, we did that, too. But that was not the that was that would have been win or lose. I, he, he was this was the advice for if you've lost. <laughs> it's been fascinating to talk to you, Senator. Thank you very much for your time. I'm really glad we could do this. Thank you. And thank you for being with us so much then. Until we meet again, take care and goodbye. <laughs>